All right, we are uh, we are now recording. We're live. We're we're it's shared. It's out there on the books of faces. And uh, thanks everybody for participating. This is episode. Did I say twenty four? Are we twenty four? Twenty four. Twenty four weeks of this. <laughs> all right. So you can cover a whole day now watching all these episodes. Even right. more than that. Uh, actually, more than two, that. Two, two days. Two days. Yeah. yeah. So for those yeah. that are. Joining and watching on one of the live stream locations, I've shared it out to a couple locations. Um, this is the Microsoft 365 community office hours, and you've got a panel. We might have some more folks that jump in that with lots of invites out and people join time to time, but this is kind of turned in. This is the core team right here, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> We are the chosen few. Yeah, excellent. Well, we're, we've got a number of questions we're going to run through that are posted out on Facebook, uh, the Books of Faces, uh, out in the Office 365 community, Teams community, and also pulled some off of the Microsoft 365 community. So all of those are based, uh, built by the Collab 365 team. Nothing to do with, with uh, my company, Collab Talk, or any of us other than we're participants in the community. But and, it could for uh, the right amount of money. Yes, that's right. <laughs> shameless, shameless plug. So as we get started, you know, any, anything going on this week? Any any news? Any happenings? Uh, a slew of uh, 365 update emails over the weekend. Yes, major sir. change updates. I mean, it's yeah. for some reason. For some reason, they keep saying they're slowing them down, but I'm telling you, it's, I, I still get as many <laughs> as I used to. Yeah, I've got admin messages now popping into Outlook that I didn't have before, don't recall seeing. So, I mean, yeah. like in a side panel, so that's starting to fly out, which is actually one of the wishes I've got is to, so users would be notified uh, a little more proactively about um, service interruptions. To have that fly out panel in Outlook uh, is pretty helpful. I don't know if they're just targeting admins. That's my guess right now, but... Um, you know, they talk about, you know, 3%, up to 3% of users may be affected by this. You may see this. So it does help. I wonder I if they're that. doing a, a big push for before at night where they're trying to squeeze some of this stuff rolled out because they're saying, you know, a lot of it is August and September. They want it by the end of August, they will, you know, beginning of September, and that's, that's right around at night. So, yeah, yeah that's right now, actually, end of August. Yeah, I went in this morning and was looking at my tenant um, to see if the update with uh, the turning NDI on in in uh, my tenant yeah. so w was there. I went into the uh, organizational permissions and, and, and turned it on for the entire organization, entire organization of one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's like, 100% yeah. percent deployment. So, so a lot of the settings have not yet, uh, you know, propagated over. So I don't know how long that that takes. I don't have the options to go in and do anything to see anything yet. But at least it's turned on now, so that can happen. Hopefully later today. I'd love to be playing with that. And for right. folks that don't know, with the N NDI as well, it's it allows you to essentially to go in and grab the individual streams, the video streams through Teams. So for video production, one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons why I've continued to pay for um, uh, using Zoom, uh, the webinar, is that the uh, you know my ability to go in and get higher quality individual streams. Um, so this is something that, again, hopefully soon can stop having to pay for that and and uh, yeah, just use Teams. I still have to use it for webinars. Yeah, li live events are not yet, in my view, ready for prime time for webinars. Just too much of a pain in the butt. Yeah, well, I know academia is preferential towards Zoom just because of ease and getting people up and running quickly. Um, none of the authentication stuff on the front end to slow users down, and get students into classes. Yep. Yeah, I haven't heard uh, complaining about uh, people getting uh, you know, having uh, uh, hackers or just uh, people, you know, uh, um, hijacking webinars on out on Zoom. So they seem to some of those security features seem to have fixed those those problems. But yeah, it needs to be one click email, send an invite, 
somebody clicks on a link, they're in. Yeah. And if if a meeting is firewalled off, that there's there's no chance of them getting any additional capabilities. You can maybe by default you just limit what people can do when they're invited via email. If they want to have any other features, they need to uh, uh, be authenticated. They need to you know be in the system. But I don't know. Yeah. I just sent over a screenshot. I don't know if you can see that in chat, but that's the NDI option now that shows up in my client. So it's on the bottom. I need to open that up. Very cool. It's the bottom option. Yep. Yeah. So that's not showing up yet in my permissions. So that's what I'm waiting for that view. So. All right. Well, uh, any other questions to add to the mix, gentlemen, before we get started? Want to get our T-shirts out of the way? I don't have one today. It's you two. <gasps> no. Sorry, man. Go Say for it, it ain't so. <sighs> A lot of writing. I know. That shouldn't happen. Why does that happen? What's the bottom two? I can't see. Oh, I see. How did that ever work? <laughs> A lot of truth in this uh, T-shirt. Love the flowchart. Love the flowchart. <laughs> yeah, see, I'm, I, I'm doing it. I, 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 this is a rerun for me again. So it was. Uh, but it's a good one. I told you I've, I have another batch of this six dollar T-shirt showing up. So did they come uh, in? They haven't come in yet, though, right? No, no. It, it's they're still because of COVID. They're uh, they're really slow. So maybe by the time before I head out to Branson for that event. But yeah, so those that can't see it, it's just the. You'll shoot your eye out. Classic movie. Yeah. I want that outfit. You know. <laughs> How about you, Hal? Just just my old senior Olympic thing. Okay. Yeah. It's an oldie. But a goodie. I guess. I'm not in the position to buy brand new t-shirts every week. So, uh, yeah. They get lots of reruns. Well, when you're in the top 1% of the top 1%, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. T-shirts uh, don't break the bank. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's jump into the first question. Hopefully everybody got the email that has the, the list. And I should point yeah. out, too, we, we don't have to go with these in order. It's, I'm just – I randomly place them on here, so there's no logic so you, to this. You got, like, four of them from this uh, Miss Hernandez here. So I, I mean, know. Yeah. And uh, – Mr. Mr. Mickey Rourke pays us a visit today. That is nice. Uh, oh, Riz? I want Riz to comment on that. As long as it's not in person. Yeah, that's that's that. I, I am excited that it is the actual Mickey Rourke who's <laughs> asked the question. So that's that's exciting. Uh, you know, just uh, yeah, quick, just a uh, kind of interesting factoid that he is a huge Microsoft Teams fan. So no, yeah, no. Which may or may not be true. People yeah. don't lie online. I mean, they come on. <laughs> Sorry, actually, his question is not about teams, so I don't know that he's a teams fan. So. <laughs> All right, well, let's start with question number one. Julie, alternative, Julie. alternative facts with with uh, <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, hey, if I go and post it on Twitter and put some hashtags in it, it'll be legit. This is about most of the news that we read today. Read on Twitter must be true. All right, Julie says, how can I organize the conversations in a group inbox? We have no functionality to create subfolders to categorize items. The team is needing to organize their group folders. What solutions have you all used to organize these? Have you guys played with that at all? No. No. I haven't. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you Christian. Yeah. No, I was I was hoping you guys had some other solutions. I, I don't. I believe it's just the the uh, in Outlook. They that they show up the way that they show up. Let me go down to it and well, in the in the in Outlook they do, but the Outlook web. I think you can turn any any mailbox into a client threaded conversation or a, a, a threaded conversation. Any mailbox can be the right mailbox. Yeah, but I think. <laughs> I think in the web you can. I don't think you can do it in full outlook. Ask yeah. your doctor if this mailbox is right for you. Well, one of the things, the one thing that I do, um, if you are accessing the same 
groups. You're members of, as we all are, of dozens of groups. Um, and there's Mr. Ricks. We'll, we'll see if Don't he let him in. more to say on the topic. We need oh, an yeah. ambition for him. Now. There we go. I'll move us to uh, together mode as well on the view. There we go. Oh, boy. So the live stream, we're, we're all together, which is so nice. Um, we just we just made a comment, Eric, about uh, being excited about Mickey Rourke asking questions. So that'll be exciting later. Um, no, I was just saying, as far as organizing the, the the group, so one of the things that I do, while we're all members of dozens of them, in the Outlook desktop client is I have, so I have two of them, including this office hours, um, that I've added to favorites. So it is something that is part of my quick flow, my organization, the 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 groups that I'm most you know actively you know going and taking a look at what's happening there it's it it's at least in my favorites so it's a quicker filter that I'm not having to scroll down expand the groups link and uh, then jump into a space so uh, but I don't believe that there's anything else it's it doesn't act the same as another category inside of Outlook but Mike to your point I'm just I'm not I don't use on a regular basis the Outlook for the web to know if it does anything else. Right. I don't know if somebody has that open, can take a look. Can you do any other filtering, you know, within that, or is it limited? Yeah. I mean, there's there's no other filtered views. You don't have it's the same controls as you would a folder within an Outlook. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I honestly I don't do much Teams administration. I'm a consumer, but I leave the Teams admin to other people. That I only really interact where it comes into play with SharePoint. Yep. Yeah, I said that the uh, only other thing you can do is, uh, of course, is search within that. I'm seeing if you can. Uh, save a search result. I don't think so. Um, yeah, there's no way to share that or save that as a view. You can just that's it's very limited on what you can do um, with the groups. So yeah, I'm I'm not aware of any other capability to uh, organize your view there. So. Sorry, Julie. But Julie has lots of other questions on this. Yes, she does. <clears throat> All right, so let's uh, let's jump down to number two. Uh, James asks uh, for anyone else that's using the website tab approach to display libraries in the associated SharePoint site of a team. Have you found recently that you can't create new files from the new dropdown anymore? And he says, I've had users reporting this and testing it on two tenants, and I'm seeing the same issue. You click, say, Word document, and nothing happens. Go into SharePoint site itself, and it works fine. Well, um, I know that some of those menus and drop downs frequently suffer uh, debilitate, debilitating issues. And it makes me think back to the. Uh, a buddy of mine whose father is a neuro, uh, neurologist, and the patient who comes in and goes, doctor, it hurts when I do this. And his response is, stop oh, doing God. that. So, you know, I never, I won't say never, but I try, you just said not, never. I try not to create things uh, in the uh, view in Teams. I'll go straight to SharePoint uh, because when you're moving files, you know, there's, there's an amount of uh, back and forth between SharePoint teams that happens, so I would rather just do it in SharePoint and have it work. I know that doesn't answer your question, but you do have a valid workaround here. So I don't know that I don't know what's going on with that new button. Um, I guess we'll find out at some point, maybe. Yeah, so that's my way of saying I don't have an answer other than to work around it. Version of that joke, which is not for the recording public. You're very quiet there, Mr. Riz. Yeah. There's a first for everything. 
You sure you're not muting them, Christian? <laughs> if I if I could, I would. But no. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, now, now, now you just mute yourself and then just mumble and. <laughs> How's that? Is that better? Is that better for yeah. you? Much better? Okay. Much better. Cool. What I said was, I have another version of that joke, which I'd be happy to share with you guys. It is not for the recording public, but we can yeah. talk about it later. Uh, Excellent. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't had any problems with the new drop down. It, it, it's all been working for me. So if I don't know if anybody else is having problems with that. Now you sound like a developer. Works on my system. Well, <laughs> I, I, so I'm asking if if anybody else on this recording is having a problem with the new drop down, uh, you know, so that I've not seen it or read about it. If nobody else here has had a similar problem, um, I, I mean, I, I, my logically, I would say go and uh, it, contact support, log that as an issue. I don't. I'm just not aware of any other issue in it. It seems like if other users within your tenant are having the problem, there could be a tenant level issue and uh, at least let Microsoft know and log that. That was, that was that was the point I was making, Sean. Good point. So basically, it's high school time. It's you, not me. <clears throat> Pretty much a little bit. Uh, Everyone smiles at that one because we all we all know what the history is of that. What's the lineage of that one? No, 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 no need to do that. Number three, Alki asks, uh, why does when updating my phone number in Delve? Okay, there's a problem right there, but I'll I'll ask the rest of the question. Why when updating my phone number in Delve, uh, it's not updating in Azure AD? That. Depends on how Azure AD is populated and where the true source of uh, your account is. If you're synchronizing from an on-prem AD, that's going to overwrite everything going in there, typically. Um, and I'm. <laughs> why don't you go ahead and uh, illuminate the updating in Delve problem? I mean, it exists all over the place, but. Um, you can update in many places in Office 365, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to write back to Azure AD. We try to limit write backs to Azure AD because people can put all kinds of stuff in there. Yeah, and and AD is 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 the truth of source. So um, it's the Azure AD, but also like you said, on premises AD. If you're doing the sync, now you can you can modify attributes. Uh, of a on-premises AD, if that's allowed, you know, in sync. But uh, Azure AD, it's it's uh, it's all role-based, so it all depends on what role you play, and um, you know, who. If you update something, it could just show it for you and no one else. Yeah, you would. Uh, you probably ought to have a talk with your AD admins. Um, and typically their attitude is reflected in whether or not attributes are written back and things like that. Lots of AD admins do not like information that they don't check or somehow put through uh, uh, a cleaning process to show up in AD. Uh, so if you want it changed for sure, if you're synchronizing from on-prem to the cloud, uh, chances are it's got to be modified there and then propagated out. It's, is it, wasn't that the first product out by Hyperfish was essentially putting a UI in the front end of that to allow admins to have a more consistent profile update process for end users? Uh, yeah, they allowed you to do that. But again, it's, um, you know, it depends on whether or not your organization is uh, cloud based or whether you've got an on prem directory source. Um, Hyperfish, I believe, would work fine for cloud-based organizations wanting to make changes. It also gave users uh, the opportunity to modify uh, attributes if it was allowed. It, it basically gave more control over that whole process. Uh, I can't speak to the specifics of it, but it was pretty slick what it did. <clears throat> I should point out, so we've got uh, quite a few people watching and that, that we're live streaming in a couple different locations, but um, Abdul, why the angry face? 
if there's a if there's a question that you have, anybody watching the live stream, if you have a question, if we've not given you a satisfactory answer, you know, please feel free to comment. Uh, he may the- not like the answer, <laughs> which is understandable. Yeah, but uh, feel free to ask a a question. I'm sure it's all love coming from Abdul. Come on, yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, but. save for the angry face. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to the angry hand. Tough love. Yeah. All right. Um, let's go to jump. Oh, to number four, to Mickey, Mickey Rourke. Rourke. So let's. Well, first, let's say favorite Mickey Rourke movies or characters. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to answer his question. I think it's appropriate we talk about his movies first. I agree. I think that's only fair. What is it? What'd you say, Riz? I said, I think that's only fair. We should definitely be answering that. Favorite movie, favorite characters. I like Iron Man. I thought he played a a wonderfully uh, deranged Russian scientist. (laughs) I think you could put deranged in front of many of his roles. Most of his roles as, as of late. So, all right. So, uh, Mickey asks, uh, folks, it's, it, I don't believe it's the actual Mickey Rourke, the actor, but we'll just, I just want to put that caveat in there. It's like, yeah. could we, we don't know. We so will he, call him later. We, we will call him Bruiser Stone. Okay. <laughs> Those that want to pick up on that reference. <laughs> so, he says, I, I bought a license for Office Home and Student 2019, it does not expire. I met the so I had the new laptop at the Office 365 client pre-installed. Can I just log in with any Microsoft account and put in the activation code and it works? In other words, is the activation code connected to the Microsoft account? So some more detail of going in and logging in to that. So you you buy a new laptop, it has things pre-installed, but if he already has a, a license. Um, and he's not activated it. Uh, one, I mean, I I, I agree. I, I don't believe that license activates. Does anybody have like a 2001 license they never activated? Is it still good? Is it? Is there a dollar value on something? If it's, you know, to say that it doesn't expire ever, I don't know if that's true. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if that's true. Number one, but number two, um, you can just change the product key. I mean, that's all you have to do is go into the, yeah. the actual, open up Word, um, click on on the the uh, left arrow next to file, um, go to I think it's uh, you know somewhere on there it shows um, you know uh, change your product key or activate and then you can change the product key. You put in that that new product key and then you're golden. You know that's all there is to it. Now, when you're working with subscriptions, they're different because subscriptions are definitely tied to a either Microsoft account ID, Microsoft ID, or a work or school account that's created inside of Microsoft. I mean, there's no, there's no way around that for a subscription because that's just the way Microsoft does that. So. I've never had any issues activating products with various accounts using the right. key. Yeah. Um, but to Mike's point, um, it's easy enough to change that um, and if you can't actually find that in Office from his description, there are, there are tons of uh, links that you can easily find. Right. And what Office will do is Office will keep prompting you to log in. It'll, all, it'll keep doing that, even though the key is not tied to an actual login, but it'll keep prompting you because they want you to log in so you can share and, uh, you know, upload stuff to OneDrive and do all that other kind of fun stuff. But it's not it's not necessary. But you sometimes have to jump through hoops to avoid yeah. doing it. Microsoft's a pain in the ass that way. Yeah. Well, they want you online. They want you consuming online resources because that's where they make money. <laughs> I don't know why. We understand. <laughs> Consumption driven. Yeah. 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 I've had. Uh, I think we've all been through that experience of going in and and uh, updated product keys and you know. But from the services side, the one thing that. Uh, I'm seeing, I'm hearing more and more, and I think we've answered a number of times through uh, the 24 weeks, um, where uh, 
functionality is lost and it comes yeah. back to just like everything in SharePoint at its root, there's a permissions issue. It's the same problem with the licensing. What's happened is that there's something that's changed that they've, uh, you know, they didn't renew something. Uh, and so a license is expired and locked certain features or an admin has gone in and changed the profile. That's happened a number of times um, with, uh, yeah. with environments. I've experienced that with a couple of my customers where I've had full emails, full logins to their Office 365 environments, and they've gone in playing with the licenses and been like, oh, and Christian, our consultant, doesn't need to have this. You revoked. You know? <laughs> and so they, yeah. they, they changed the license type, and suddenly I wasn't able to get access to half the stuff that I need access to. And we're we're racking our brains, and I it, it, so now I know just to go back. This is the first place I go and check is like, did you change the license type? Yeah, uh, yeah. And if you really focused in, in, I hope we answered his question, but he's asking about any Microsoft account being able to to activate that Office 2019. You don't need an account to activate it. Okay. It, it the thing is, you put in that product key. It'll say it'll go through activation, but you don't have to log in as an account to do that. Um, it's just like Windows 10. When you log in Windows 10, it wants you to log in with a, a Microsoft ID or a work or school account, but you don't have to. You can use a local account and Windows 10 will activate just fine. It's just Microsoft is pushing you to do that and not necessarily making it very clear that you don't have to. Put differently, I think, we can say that license keys are tied to the machine and right. that particular activation. Um, actually, no, I would disagree with that. The license key, license key is not tied to the machine, it's tied to the software because of the fact that that software can be installed on multiple machines and it, it isn't tied to that machine at all. Okay, uh, my mistake, I mean, but that that's, license that's key will deep. activate it on that machine and so that instance will work. Correct. It's not. I'm trying to differentiate between being tied to the account and being tied to a particular activation. I, I would say that there is a tie to the hardware though. It, you have like the home user where you've got what five installs. It knows which devices I have that install and 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 debits that you know the, those licenses for that for the, the yeah, did you did you ever notice that you can do more installs than what's available? I've never yeah. tried, but they give you a buffer. Yeah. <laughs> As somebody who constantly reinstalls software, I'm always <laughs> contacting software companies to reset the limit or give me another few activations. Like you can deactivate all of these, but you know, I just set up a new machine. Yes, I did it again in the last three months or whatever. I'm not lying to you. I don't want an extra installation. I just want my main machine to work. Yeah. Um, and also, particularly with Windows, and I don't think Office is this way, but if you change your hardware profile too radically, especially if you change like the hardware abstraction layer. And use, BitLocker. 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 Yeah, that's another one. But the uh, network card, oftentimes yeah. it's tied to a MAC address. Uh, you change too much hardware and suddenly you've got to reactivate. So, Correct. Yeah, uh, that that, that's right. Windows. That's not Office. Correct. That, that's what Sean was saying. He's, he was pointing more at Windows for that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they've got various ways. No, they I had have a friend over the weekend that had a copy of Office 2007 uh, that he needed to reinstall on a different machine. The one that he had blew up. Sorry, Sorry for we, were able to, we were able to take that Office 2007 and the product key and install it just fine on a different piece of hardware. Again, that's an old MSI version of Office 2007. Yeah. Installed fine. I do that stuff all the time with VMs. Um, yeah. Typically going back, you know, SharePoint 2010, SharePoint Destroyer 2007, all those wonderful things. <laughs> I I don't think that was the actual product name, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> Funny, that's what everybody remembers. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, question number five from Dallin. It's actually, I think, pretty short question, but I just uh, I thought it was important to to answer this one as well, but. Uh, have enabled some custom messaging and meeting policies and targeted some groups. Users in the so that's the problem right there. You shouldn't target people <laughs> in the groups. It's just it's just wrong. Uh, 
Users of the groups uh, uh, still have the global default policies, and it's been six hours or more since deployed. The tech documentation says it takes some time to propagate changes, uh, but is six hours excessive? Um, and I, I'll, I answer this right off the bat. Number one, is it excessive uh, from a technology standpoint? Absolutely. Um, but it is, it, is it a trait of Microsoft? Absolutely. Because, uh, I mean, <clears throat> you know, just, just a, a, a user change for some reason can take, I've seen it take up to two hours just to make uh, attribute changes to users in AD or in, in Azure AD. Um, and that's just, it's hit or miss. <laughs> so, so I just want to point out that like five years ago, uh, six years ago, a, a change in, in having to wait for the overnight processes to run on a server to see those changes propagate was the acceptable. The and now job. we're like, yep. two hours? Are you <laughs> kidding me? Spin up some JCL, get that batch job done. Yeah. And I got to tell you, if, if, does anybody here use Adobe? Adobe, the creative suite? Yeah, I do. So you know that they, if you make changes to your, your licensing in Adobe Creative Suite, you have to wait 24 hours because they do just what you said, is that they run jobs every 24 hours to update oh, their geez. licensing. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. Thanks for that tip, Mike. Yeah, they still use the old licensing. So. <laughs> oh, boy. But no, six hours, it, it is, that's bordering excessive, but I mean, they'll oftentimes they wait up to 24 hours yeah uh, and if the tenant is under load or uh you're queued up behind a bunch of people uh, depending on the operation uh it can take some time so i would say go away for the day come back and if it's still that way uh, when you come in the next day yell at microsoft or something it's one of the arguments that i've gotten from a, a couple of uh, admins that i would be coaching on how to use, uh, how to set up users in Azure AD and stuff like that, they would come back and they'd be like, why does this take so long compared to on-prem? And I'm like, you know, it's it's the reality of what it is. It's uh, the cloud, it's, you know, you, you don't have any control over it. It's a managed service, so. Uh, yeah, and there are, it reflects something of a, a lack of appreciation for exactly how many pieces are in play on the back end and services and data centers. And we're talking about replicating things out and <coughs> that stuff doesn't happen instantaneously. In fact, when we get things as quickly as we do sometimes, I'm more surprised by that and suspicious than when it takes a while to while. Yeah, it's all about the instant gratification. You know, these kids these days, they just want things done just like that, you know? Push the button, push the button. <laughs> You know, we don't really talk about it anymore since we've kind of all we're focusing so much in the cloud, but there's still I mean, massive, you know, on premises installations. There are you know organizations that have valid use cases for, as Sean, as you point out, who have these replication scenarios for their environments. We talk about um, I mean, it's improved greatly when I when I got into the online collaboration space back in um, 2001, 2002, working for E2 Open. And we built a hosted, it was a dedicated cloud collaboration platform called Collaboration Manager. And we were dealing with um, uh, with manufacturing companies and the design partners for products. You think about you know creating a, a TV or a DVD player or whatever, that kind of electronics manufacturing. And they'd have a design firm in Japan and, and with all their massive CAD drawings and and headquarters for the tech company in the San Francisco Bay Area with manufacturing components in Ottawa and Georgia, uh, um, you know, they just all over the world moving massive files. And uh, and so the and our expectation is now is I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to move, you know, uh, uh, terabytes of data per day around this. And it's still not uh, realistic with the size, increasingly large size of these design files. And so that it's just, you, you've got other, it's a whole nother world that we don't talk about in the office collaboration space, but where there are va valid scenarios, WAN optimization is still a thing. The, you know, on-prem and hybrid environments are still a thing. Replication happens. Remote differential compression. 
Yes. I mean, even even we we were talking about we've talked about previously, like South Africa. We were talking about was it last week or two weeks ago? And there was a question where they're having like performance issues until those data centers went online. And I still don't know all of the the gaps there. They were being serviced the majority of companies out of you know South Africa, out of the UK data center or Ireland, uh, and so the performance was abysmal for a lot of the things that we take for granted. So, and that's still their stream solution. I was just going to say that, as uh, we found out from Alistair and uh, Tracy. Yeah, and there's no date on that either. It's uh, not that I've seen to be announced. TBA. Yes. Yeah, so that, that that was a uh, so so back in the day, five to seven years ago, a little bit longer uh, for some of the conversations in. But you know where where we were talking a lot about performance. It just wasn't about. It wasn't just about hey these services are available. But then you also had to look at you know how are my teams collaborating? What is the performance like? Is that a subpar experience? Just because you're connected, it just could be an abysmal experience where you need to look at alternate solutions. Oh, yeah. You can't just assume, hey, we all have Office 365, therefore we all have the same experience. It's just not true today. Not yet, anyway. All right, uh, still just uh, watching out there. If you're watching the live stream, we've had a few people out there. Feel free to post your questions and we'll try to answer them. Anything else pop up? Eric, any other questions that you brought with you to the table? Because we all brought questions. We answered them first off before you joined. Yes, so I actually, I'm glad you, you asked me that, Christian. It's, it's great of you to do that. You're welcome. Um, and, and I see by the response, everyone else is- This will be good. This will be good. Okay. In, in the team's environment, why would someone not see the gallery together mode and uh, large gallery options? I do not see that. Just so everyone knows, every team meeting I've been in, I do not have that option, even though it's enabled on my tenant or it's supposed to be, it says that the upgrade went through, but I have, I cannot see that. Yeah. So if it, yeah, so so it's uh, so it's not a default view that if I turn it on for this meeting that I'm running, everybody doesn't see it. So those that are watching on the live stream, they see the together mode because I'm sharing my screen. So you see my view. So I go up into the ellipses up at the top in the, under more actions, and there I've got the together mode option. Um, so that is, and I've got the dynamic gallery, and I'll switch over to the. So here I don't, have, I don't have an ellipsis, so is that a host thing only? No, you should uh, have it regardless. Yeah. So I don't, have, I don't have it at all. So here's something that's different. When I jump over to other tenants where I'm a guest, I can see the more actions. I have the dynamic view. So so here I'm down at the bottom right side of this in this this meeting. Uh, it, when the recording comes back, you'll see all five of our pictures on there and it'll it will adjust. Um, but for this, it's a little bit different since I'm presenting, you're seeing my desktop, but that's where you would see, and if there's more than, I don't know what the minimum number is for large gallery, I guess, you know, over nine uh, or over seven, or I don't know what it is um, for the large gallery. So you get up to 49 views, so seven by seven, but that's where that together mode option is if it's enabled, if you have it. Why you're not seeing uh, it. You, have a, I, you do have a switch that you have to throw in the, in, in the client. If you go in, you have to go into this under settings, general, yep. uh, you will find under the application heading down near the bottom, there is a little checkbox that says turn on new meeting experience. New meeting yep, and calls on. will yep. open in separate windows, requires restarting teams. If you do not do that, you will not have any of this wonderful stuff. Now, yes. that so that checkbox may or may not be there. It depends on whether they've updated your client or not. And you can throw all this stuff out the window if you're using the web client because none of that happens over there. Correct. You can also throw it out the window if you're using Zoom. So yeah. <laughs> to rephrase my question, Mr. Buckley, if I have enabled everything and come on, Sean, take a drink. You know my goal. Um, 
if you have enabled everything and you have together mode enabled and you've turned on the new meeting experience and all is well and you still see the ellipsis but those modes are not available together large gallery so on and so forth is it an admin setting that could have been thrown or is it we're just going to chalk it up to it's monday and i'm sorry you don't have that option on the desktop well in my case you again did have to fully restart teams which means not just you got to make sure it's completely shut down and gone. Uh, Teams has a habit of hanging around in the taskbar. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's a good point. That I So as I was going and looking for it as well, and, and Mike, I don't know if you've tried that. So I actually did go down in the system tray, turned yeah. off Teams, and then log, re-logged back in. That was actually a recommendation that I read somewhere. And maybe and, he's trying that right now. And Mike disappears. Yeah. I think he meant to say, let me try that right now. I'll be right back. I, I think I, I think of uh, before you just shut off the camera and disappear. We have to start doing it just as as matter of best practice is to do -do -do, do -do -do, do -do -do. <laughs> Wayne's World little uh, yeah reference yeah reference yeah, yeah. so and then I'll do that do -do -do -do. and oh, he's gone. Wow, oh, he man. did it. He actually oh, that's oh yeah, I was excited. He's back. There you yeah. Go. Wow. Hey, quick question while we're waiting for Mike to find himself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Eric, uh, Eric hey. asked a question. Uh, oh, let him back in. <laughs> Decline. <laughs> Mike. Yeah. Did it work? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> we don't have your video, yeah. Mike. Yep. Yeah, no, it should be coming. Okay, so I did that, and I even went out to task task uh, manager, uh, made sure there was no team task running, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, bring it back up. I still have the same view that I've always had. So um, I'm gonna actually uninstall Teams and reinstall it to see if it makes any difference. But hey, are uh, you in uh, uh, preview? Uh, um, one of the um, advanced release tenants. Are you on a like no. slow ring? Or just, no. 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 So could that perhaps be? No idea. I don't know if this is an is it. I think that would be an answer to Riz's question. Then I mean, if we knew. Yeah. So to add on to that question too is that uh, I don't know if you guys have seen a difference when in over in guest networks, uh, the options disappear in some cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm just I assumed that was the case because maybe they don't have it enabled for their tenant, therefore I wouldn't see it since it's a I mean, I just assumed that if I have it in my client for my profile as I move in between, it's my view. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that preview together mode is my view of, of things that it would follow me, but it doesn't seem no. to follow. So let, let me ask you this. It follows what the parent tells it to do yeah. or doesn't tell it to do. Um, I mean, that, that's or my does it, Or does it not tell you to not do it or not do it, do it? Secretly Something tell you behind like your back. <laughs> it Sorry. is your view, and you are entitled to it. I, it's interesting because essentially, while you were trying to throw me a, a, a curveball, the response is we actually don't have a response to that issue. So I'll get back and comment on that later, Eric, whether I have uh, uh, an answer to or a non comment. Christian has homework, is what he's saying. <laughs> All right. Yes, uh, me, we appreciate your question, and while we don't have an answer for you at this time, I we admire the provide one in future. Let me ask a question related to that. Um, does anybody turn down the live transcript or the live uh, caption? Yeah. Yes. yes. Love it. Yeah. Do you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Love yeah. it. It's nice. You know what I was thinking about is, does it also work in the, for those that don't know, you've got the live transcripts. It's really, what's really nice about that. Uh, so I've not done this in practice yet, but does it, so my first question, does it work in the browser version? No. Okay. No. So if you are uh, struggling that you've got overlapping meetings going on, um, have your primary that you need to listen to in the browser and in the desktop version, participate in the other one with the transcripts on so you can have silently the text. Then yeah. you can lose context and degrade your experience for two meetings at the same time. 
Yes. That's my. This is true. So a couple things. From... If you really want to be creative, if, you, if you've got three meetings, you could run the primary one that you just want to watch the uh, the the, the uh, transcription on in the in the in the main. But two two I. The most I've been able to get out of a out of a browser has been two windows, two different meetings. Uh, the third one it hangs you up on one of them. So uh, two meetings, three two at meetings. once, three at once. Yeah. Yep. You're a masochist, Hal. Yeah. A, a couple things from a speaker perspective. Uh, I find that the, um, the 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 tele what I call the teleprompter, even though it's it's showing you the words after you speak them, which would yeah. wouldn't be a teleprompter. But anyway, the transcription mode. I find that as a speaker, if the transcription is on, I slow down. I oh. slow down my delivery to make sure that it's accurate. Yeah. And actually, slowing down your delivery to make sure that it's accurate gives a better experience to the person who's watching it and, and listening to it because you're not slurring. And you're being very clear with the information that you are providing. Uh, but at the same time, I also find that that takes away from what you're delivering because you're focused on your delivery and you're, you can't do everything at once. So you're, you actually, end up reading everything that you're saying while you're saying it, and then you just make a mess. Yeah. So uh, last year um, when they were doing the uh, – when we were in person at the, the summit, uh, they actually had all the uh, – when they were doing the, the uh, presentations, they had the – going across the screen and i had asked about that uh and uh one of the guys told me one of the pms told me that microsoft actually went through and in their speaker training that they give their pms um, they actually sh have that running at the same time and they tell them to slow down so they're teaching them to slow down when they speak um, and not only for like you mentioned two reasons number one the transcription but number two is because the audience can follow uh, a little bit better. It has more of an impact. But at the same time, when you're trying to make an impact with what you're talking about, when you're trying to emphasize what you're talking about, I do this myself, is I, I actually accelerate when I'm trying to emphasize. And that kind of, you look at some of the wording and it just kind of you know, across the screen. But um, I think it works pretty well. I really do. Well, especially if you keep using the word empathize. Emphasize. And for what? what? What did he say? It, it's not going to all get in there, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the slower you speak, the better it will pick it up. But um, a, a little uh, cheap comment for those that want to practice their speaking. You can use some of the stuff that's in PowerPoint, but you can also create, if you have access to a tenant, you can create your own meeting, turn yeah. on turn on the transcription and, and watch it go and practice with it. So I watched, the, I watched a Microsoft Reactor presentation last week. And they actually had a gentleman on there, two presenters. One was, uh, one presenter spoke English and the other one spoke Spanish. And the transcription came across in both languages. So it was, it was kind of impressive. So it's even becoming multilingual, which is really kind of cool. I know. Yeah, we've talked about that in the past that the Microsoft Translator, uh, so it had, there was that dedicated site. I believe it's still out there. But yeah. I had used that uh, years ago. Uh, it was at a SharePoint Saturday, uh, Sacramento, and had um, some Spanish native speakers that were there were really struggling. And I, and so before the session, I said, "Yo, I'm going to go turn this on." And basically, what it was was the. Um, so as I was giving my presentation, I had my laptop camera pointing at me, standing right up front, so I had to be on camera and near the microphone there. But they were sitting looking at my, so that camera view, their laptop of my presentation, and it was doing the translation of Spanish in real time, and it worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it was a really nice uh, uh, service. And so, I, I, yeah, to have that integrated, embedded as part of the default Teams experience, um, that's kind of what Satya, four or five years ago, demoed live on stage, his first, first or second keynote as CEO and where it was uh, a German translation. And we've talked about this in the past because I uh, was chatting with, because I think they also, uh, they had uh, Tagalog as one of the supported languages early on. And I had asked my daughter, if you guys remember us talking about this, I asked my daughter who speaks fluent, fluently uh, Tagalog, uh, lived in the Philippines for a couple of years, um, how accurate it was she's like she was surprised at how accurate it was 
Um, she's like the intonations are there um, with the with the robotic voice. She's like it sounds really good. The text was very accurate. So um, kudos to Microsoft for doing that. Hey, I do want to? Uh, we've got uh, less than ten minutes here. Eric asked a question. I think is a good one to answer. He's asking if we have any advice about users of Teams in the education world. Is it? Uh, it says is it almost impossible to get a test tenant using Microsoft Education version? And we we have we so we have talked about this in the past. I don't remember. I think one of our first ones. Um, but the uh, uh, we got a response, and so Jethro Seegers, who's a former MVP, who is now at Microsoft, and he uh, is he's a product is he product engineering, product marketing, but on the education side of Microsoft Teams. So if you can go and find Jethro Seegers, um, so I think he had responded back and said, "Hey, put him in touch with me. I might be able to help him out." So I I, I don't believe that the like the demo.microsoft.com supports the education sector. I don't think that there's just a demo version of that, but it is something if you're in need of that, that uh, Jethro may be able to help you out. There yeah. is another, yeah, and there is another option too, um, is the 365 developer. Um, the ability, if you have a Visual Studio subscription, you get a, a 365 developer, which has M M1, M3, and M5, or e e E1, E3, and E5, but I don't know if it has that U in it. Minimum will be um, making sure you've got an EDU uh, mail address. Yeah. So, which I assume you do. Which I recently find out is not hard to get, even though you don't go to an actual school. <laughs> That's just weird, Mike. Yeah, yeah, you can look it up online, man. It's good. Uh, Nelson it Universities in Business. Yeah, I was looking. Yeah, because there's a uh, there's a university discount, and uh, my son is like, well, you know, he goes to school, and he's like, Dad, you can use my email, and I'm like, yeah, okay, and I'm like, I wonder how easy it is to get an EDU address, you know? And sure enough, you can go out to this college in California, and you just tell them that you you know fill out an admission thing, which basically ask you about five questions and then after that they send you an email address <laughs> you've got a guy to you <laughs> <Bing>. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's that's great so <laughs> way, to break, way to break the system mike uh, yeah thanks for sharing that it's out there and google it, it. it's out we'll there it's not me out post don't it's worry not me I, google google you know that exposes everything so don't shoot the messenger yeah All that's right. right christian you can you can cut and splice right here and any other questions in our last few minutes? <laughs> All right. Well, here's a here's a question. Um, uh, uh, Nini asks. I think that Nini Nini. I apologize if we are if we mispronounce any names here. Says I need to move in files and map structure put on the SharePoint page onto a team site uh, into the Teams interface. Does anyone know how I make that easy? If I create a channel in Teams with the same name, the folder with the SharePoint page reflects. But if I want to lift the whole structure into files, it doesn't work to do that. So they essentially want to replicate the file structure over here and recreate it in Teams. And uh, is anybody aware of a third-party tool that does that since you cannot <coughs> get the box? Tools to, uh, so I did a little bit of, you know, I. Many of the organizations that we've been doing uh, migrations for have wanted to teamify existing SharePoint sites. And I'll put a link here. Now this is, it should be noted that this is a ShareGate link. Um, so I think that they're probably gonna reference their, their tools and services, but that's not required. The, you can teamify a SharePoint site, you know, as far as uh, lists and libraries and things go, but as far as, you know, somehow replicating that entire site into Teams, that's not the way it typically goes. Um, so if you're looking at just, you know, making files and whatnot available in those structures, uh, as well as some of the pages, you can teamify the site. There are other references too, if you look up teamify, um SharePoint sites you can get all kinds of hits online. 
amongst yeah, which. A, but uh, it's the other half of the question there. It's not just replicating what's out there, but uh, you know, once you create that uh, that the channel and the team with the same name, uh, does the folder or the SharePoint page reflect that? It doesn't work quite the same way. You can't just map that over. It doesn't quite work like that. So, um, yeah, it, it's with a lot of the recommendations with, uh, you know, again, I'm, I've not used ShareGate or any other third party tools to try to solve this specific problem, replicate or teamify a, a SharePoint site that has that folder depth. Um, but it's not meant to be an apples to apples. It's an opportunity for you to go in and flatten a lot of that structure and to use metadata, to use tags and, and other things to uh, to not simply, you know, lift and shift your hot mess of a SharePoint site into Teams. <laughs> Flattening the site structure is going to be a requirement. Um, wow. So that's the new way of doing things with Microsoft. If you've got subsites and whatnot, you're going to have to flatten those out into um, pretty much a root root web or root level site. Um, and you can promote subsites to site collections with certain tools and whatnot. I mean, there's a ability for that. But as Christian said, it's not apples to oranges. But there is a path there. It just depends on what you've got right now, how tough that's going to be to follow. Yeah, it is apples to oranges. It's not apples to apples. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that, that's. I just that's I, anytime I can point out that you're wrong, Sean. I'm. That's one time this year I've been able to point that out. So thank you. Uh, I'm sure we're, my wife has an easy time of that. <laughs> I know we talk. All right. Uh, so last question that we we'll try to address here, um, Julie. Our favorite, Julie Hernandez, um, says, I'm curious if Office 365 is realistic to use in place of databases. We're no. exploring the power. Shh. Just wait. We're exploring the power platforms and using flows and power apps to reference and populate lists. But it seems like Microsoft is pushing these as alternatives to a database, yet flow struggle with some basic steps and was overloaded with a three-step flow we tested. It seems to me there's still a need for a database to pull data rather than multiple lists. Thoughts? No, it's not a replacement. Even though lists may give the impression of being uh, similar to tables, they are not anything like tables. Uh, if you're looking for relational databases, truly relational databases, third normal form, you know, the kind of stuff you build in SQL, you do that in a database. If you can get by with loose referential integrity, if any referential integrity at all, um, and you just want, you know, like a lookup column, which just gets you one hop to some related item, SharePoint lists will work, but lists are not a replacement for relational data structures. There are plenty of things you can't do with them, and they do not enforce referential integrity. As as you guys all know, I'm still a huge access guy, so, you know. Yeah, that was Microsoft's attempt to get, you know, access services brought you referential integrity in SharePoint, but that was a standalone island, um, that access structure. It was not implemented as a list per se, but rather a single list item. So it was abstracted from it entirely. Yeah. All right. Well, we're Sorry, right at the Julie. we're right at the end. We're right at the top. I, I don't think that there are any other questions out on. Yeah, Liam uh, makes a great comment. He says, "I think the cloud will go away, and we will all go back to on-prem." <laughs> I, I agree. Um, where was the Where was the great comment there? Which part of that? I think I think Liam is uh, very insightful. That's the depth of quality that we get. We've we've come to expect from Liam. I think Liam will be looking for a new uh, a new job. Uh, oh, Liam will never be looking for a job. It's the job that <laughs> finds him. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody, and uh, for those that are uh, been watching the live stream, thanks a lot for uh, continue to ask questions here. We'll come back. We'll be back again at 6 p.m. Pacific this evening. 
for the uh, APAC half of this. And then uh, I should have before midnight tonight, uh, my goal today is to get both of the recordings up on YouTube before I go to sleep and uh, try and do that on Monday. That's going to be my commitment uh, to try and do that. Pushing uh, the limits, huh? It's not always possible. There's a potential family outing this evening, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to attempt to do that. Uh, worst case tomorrow, but it's out on YouTube. You go out there on the Collab Talk YouTube page and you can find all of these recordings. This is, again, the first half of episode 24. It'll be out on buckleyplanet.com as well. You can find all of our past recordings. And if you've not visited the page, and seeing what, what we do is that uh, there's a list of every single topic that we cover over the each of these sessions and, and the two-hour recordings that we provide uh, so that you can don't have to wade through all two hours. You can just jump to the item that you're interested in and go from there. So with that, gentlemen, thanks so much. And uh, we'll talk to you this evening, except for Eric, because he has to get his 12 hours of beauty sleep. <laughs> at least. At least 12 hours. All right. Not including the time change. Have a good week, everybody. Have a good one. Bye. See you tonight. Dickies. Come on, Link. Where are you? Link. Oh, I'm thinking language integrated query, but that's me. And here we are. This is part two uh, of the Microsoft Community Office Hours live stream here and where it's AMA style ask us anything about Microsoft products or services and Mike bailed and, <laughs> and Video Mike bailed. Here. He, he's a talking bubble that's right actually me, what yeah. happened is and just so you guys know is that I did do a reinstall of team oh so totally gutted it reinstalled it and now I have together mode. Woohoo! Yeah. awesome so, well, we're live streaming. I just switched it over to together mode as well. Um, so that's all exciting and, and all that. So, um, yeah. Uh, there we go. Yep. There we go. All right. So let's let's uh, jump back in. Any any follow ups to this morning's session? You had homework. We didn't. Yeah. Excellent point. I had, Mike. Fake, I had <laughs> fake homework. I didn't. It wasn't a real assignment for myself. I was. Says the, it says it sounds like a guy who just didn't He's do trying it. Trying yeah. to get out of it. He didn't do the homework. You know, I was thinking uh, of last week's session. Um, th- there's something that I want to go and explore and do. I didn't have time to do. Um, I might try this week, but I'd be interested in going and understanding with the free versions of Teams what the limits are, what some of the difficulties. There's so many questions that are out there. Uh, uh, people that have with the free versions, like I have no idea what that experience looks like. I've got a couple laptops that my I'm setting up for my sons, and I thought, hey, it's a perfect time to go in and play with and nice. see how crappy of experience it is. <laughs> it Somebody's might be great. Have a chart know. out there. Yeah. Somebody's got to have a chart. I'm gonna go look. Yeah, yeah. there there I'm must sure be something out chart. there. Chart. The better question is, is there an up to date chart? Yeah. Or better still, a roadmap. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Right on the Microsoft yeah. site. Wow. There's a link that does a comparison of. Let me uh, put it in the chat here. Yeah, I'll open up the chat so we share the link. I'll share the, the link over with those that are maybe watching on the live stream. We've got a, a handful of people. And if there's anybody that's watching the live stream, if you do have... Uh, any questions you'd like us to tackle, uh, feel free to type them in and we'll try to address them. So let me, I'll share the link here for free version of Teams and what that that experience. Eric's not here, so mm-hmm. talk about different experiences. Eric likes that for some reason. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's jump. Yes. It's like the running joke of calling everything experiences. And he kind of honed in on that and then just kept. Oh, he was keeping a fake score for a while in previous weeks. All right, let's jump in. Uh, Mark, number nine, asks. So this is a continuation. We, for those that don't know, if you're watching the live stream and, and one of the uh, the Facebook groups uh, that we shared it out to. Um, so this is the second half of, of episode 24. And it uh, looks like, sorry, I, you know, 
Sean, if I lean like this, I'm blocking your your nose, your your face. Like you're you're suddenly you're Joe Biden. You're smelling my hair. Come on, what is? <laughs> I'll move over. See that? There we go. It's just not awkward. It's not. You're making me. You're making me seasick. Your camera moves when you move, so it's like, yeah, yeah. no, no. Stop! <laughs> Stop! All right. Um, so Mark says. Uh, may I ask, how do you transfer the ownership of all teams that a user is managing if that user is leaving the company? It's a good question. So I know how to change the owner of the teams ver via Teams Admin Center if I know already the team that I need to update. Just consulting if you do have an easier script to fetch what teams a person owns so that they can add that to the, sta add that to the standard operating procedures. I don't have a script yet, but probably be easy to put together. Well, you have the ability to go in and look at all teams and filter on owner. Uh, but the admin center only lets you change a single at a team at a time. Yeah. Right. Well, well it's kind of a two part. Two I part. wonder if PowerShell, if you could PowerShell that. Oh, know. I'm sure you can. In script. fact, I'll homework. Homework that will actually be done, Christian. Oops. Good for you, Sean. Sean wants a, Sean wants a gold star. <laughs> I'll get what. In fact, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, well, you won't be in Branson, will you? You're not coming down. No, I had to uh, he's, bail he's out. Smart. He's smart. I'll have to mail concerns. you one of the. I know you've already seen it, but I'll have to mail you one of the. You know the. I don't know what to refer to it. It's, Are it's those stickers or pins? It's a pin. Wow. So it's a little ceramic be. thing. It has its little plastic covering it, so it's shinier than this. But Do, do moderators get those? Uh, <laughs> I can I, send you one. I was going to say, if you're going to be moderating all day, Mike, I, I think you're in a position to at least uh, demand I'm one. Offered, but Christian hasn't hasn't <laughs> ponied up, so I don't know what's happening. So I so I was starting trying to talk to you before when your uh, sound <laughs> wasn't on and we're, you weren't we're hearing him. Talking. Yeah, this is true, uh, Mike. It is yeah, true. about uh, about moderating because uh, for for folks that want to for for those that don't know, so I'm I'm helping uh, Mark Rackley organize uh, volunteers and things around the North American Collaboration Summit, which is happening. Uh, the last week of September in Branson, Missouri. And we're looking for moderators that will, uh, we've got morning and afternoon sessions. So it's kind of three hours and three hours. And if uh, it, and we're, we need people like in the rooms themselves, so in-person moderators as well as online. Um, if somebody shows up uh, and will moderate half a day, they get a free ticket to the event. It is a paid event. Um, <coughs> If they moderate an entire day in person, then they actually can stay an extra day on Thursday. All the speakers are going to the, uh, what is it called? It's the Silver Dollar, Silver Dollar City, City, which yeah. was rated the the number one theme park in the U.S. So roller coasters and water yeah. park and kind it's of the best. It's been a pretty that, big so. draw in the past. I know J.D. Wade would always go there with his wife. They had like memberships. So his yep. wife would come down to... Not Branson at that point. It was down in uh, Harrison, Arkansas, where Mark actually lives, yeah. about a half hour south. Well, the, the cool thing about it, so we just went here. My son and I went uh, a week and a half ago to Lagoon, which is north of Salt Lake City. And it's a small park, but a lot of big coasters. Uh, and because they're limiting the, the, the crowds in the park, it was fantastic. We had to wait at most five minutes for any ride. And most of them, we just walked right up the entire day. Fast was, pass without needing the fast pass. Exactly. And so I, I'm expecting a, a similar experience. So they're uh, throttling the number of people that are in the park in total, but even the, the access times that people can enter. So that should be a lot of fun with the speakers. So anyway, if anybody's interested... Drop me a line if you're moderating. Uh, if you're if you're interested in moderating uh, online, it's essentially it's all being run in Teams, and um, you, you get to hit a record button and be there and answer questions as they come up. But then you know we'll have er every speaker that's there in person. Um, we'll have uh, wireless mics and we'll have a lot of uh, hand sanitizer on. I don't know what else. So. All right, so. I posted a, a link in the chat. 
it's just to uh, Teams information on graph, the graph API and Teams access points and some of the uh, REST um, ver uh, the HTTP verbs and what they'll do as far as uh, the REST API goes. So that's for Mark if he wants to um, get adventurous on his own. I'll take it away as something I try and put together. So hopefully next week I'll actually have a script I can share. Yeah, that'd be great if the if you find any other documentation, Sean, that's similar. Once you're able to identify, hey, somebody's so you can go and identify. Here's all the the teams that this person who just left owns. But then, you know that you know, to change ownership or any other scripts that'd be relevant there. Yeah, well, I mean, if you go and search for um, offboarding or leaving organization, how do I, you know, phase someone out of uh, Microsoft 365, uh, they've got a number of good re uh, references on that, how you, you know, put the, uh, the account on hold, how you transfer uh, ownership of the email, that kind of stuff. Somebody listen to some tunes somewhere? Hal dropped off. Hell. He's yeah, Hal's rocking out in Arizona. Uh, all right, so question 10. Leonard asks, uh, this is a good question too. I'm about to upgrade two systems from Office 2010 and 2013 to Office 365. Any gotchas I should be aware of? I'll back up my <laughs> mail, calendar, and contacts for sure. Does the install automatically migrate them? Oh, where do we start? <laughs> well, well, let's answer the question first. No, <laughs> it's not going to migrate you, unfortunately, Leonard. No. Um, are, you know, it, it depends on uh, partially whether or not this is just you as an individual doing it, or are you part of an organization um, that's going there? And where does your email reside right now? Do you have an exchange backend? Is that going to the cloud? Um, because when it comes to migration, that's, you know, what primarily what you're going to be look at migrating um, if you're talking the office client. Uh, SharePoint, of course, is sec uh, a secondary one, but um, you didn't mention anything about SharePoint. So I'm assuming you're talking just exchange. It's, it's um, Microsoft has made that a lot easier from, you know, when they first started doing this, it was really a pain in the butt and you had to rely on third party products in order to do it. Yeah. Um, pretty much. I mean, I remember uh, I used uh, probably more than a dozen times this product uh, called Migration Wiz, uh, and uh, that was the only way I could get a volume of users, you know, 50, 100 mailboxes um, up into Azure. But they, you know, they now have the built-in wizard, you know, for each individual user, and you can do it on a uh, on a, a per-tenant basis as well. You can set the entire tenant to migrate and, you know, do that. Um, but there are still some other tools that help because the mailbox piece, I think, has actually gotten to a point where it's, you know, it, it's not as hard as it used to be. But when you start getting into, uh, number one, a lot of folks still use, you know, the whole shared folders thing. Um, they still, you know, getting into the SharePoint, getting into the moving H drives or using okay. up into OneDrive and all that other kind of fun stuff. That's a major, you know, uplift. That's a that's a lift and shift right there. Where, you know, just doing mail, not so much. You know, I, I, anymore if he's today. Just doing mail. If he's just updating the client, the client pieces from 2010 and 2013 to 365, and he's not changing the back end mechanisms or anything like that. There's really nothing <clears throat> to migrate unless he's talking about an IMAP or a pop account. He's got an Exchange account in the back end that's kept in the Exchange server. Uh, when he puts in the new client, uh, the the, uh, the his whole mailbox will just re-download right into the machine. The thing he's got to be careful of, uh, 365 will allow you to have <clears throat> more than one version of Office on the machine, and you really don't want that. Right. Okay. Uh, also, if they're new machines, make sure 365 isn't already installed. I guess since he's saying he's upgrading, that's not an issue. If he's and if he's the only one, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm assuming is this for an entire company. I I, I don't think he. I, I don't know from the base, from this well. question. I mean, I got the idea of like two systems that have two versions of Office. Sounds like yeah, real small might scale. Just be, might be hit just himself two machines up to three six five. Okay, because one of the, one of the problems that that uh, the major problems is and and everybody blames it on on DNS, but it's DNS, um, and that's just because you know if you're moving stuff. 
Um, if you don't have your domain set up correctly in the first place, it's just going to be a nightmare when you move your mailbox up there or you move anything else up there. So, but even that, they've got some really nice uh, checks on the DNS and to make sure you've got do. your records corrected. They do, but yeah, one thing that I found that people forget about is the um, Illuminati. <laughs> it's what? The Illuminati. The Illuminati. Don't the Illuminati. Mind, Mike. Yes. DNS, number one problem. Yeah. Illuminati, number Don't two. Encourage it. Right. Uh, but it's solar, the, solar flares number three. Sorry, it's, no. it's it's the propagation time. It's people don't. I mean, they sit there and they go, well, how come this isn't working? And yeah. the thing about it is, is that their ISP TTL you know, hasn't made the DNS changes that the rest of the world has. And I, I've run into this so many times where I would just be like, hey, give it give it another twelve hours, another twenty four hours. Well, I don't have twelve or twenty four hours. I got to connect my mailbox and do this, and I'm like. All right, so why don't you try it on your cell phone? And sure enough, it works on a cell phone, but won't, won't work on the computer. Well, Change because it, and I was trying to explain to them, it's two different DNS servers, you know, two yeah. di different paths that are being taken. So, yeah. But um, I, I dropped the link in here for um, Fast Track FAQ. Um, I know that Microsoft used to be that if you had fewer than 50, uh, mailboxes or accounts you were moving, you, were, you couldn't get fast track support. I know that has been dropped dramatically. I don't know if it's down to the single numbers or not, but it's worth a look. And I, did, I did some of those fast tracks, and I have to tell you that the one thing you need to be cautious for those on about those is is that uh, you will continue, you will get calls and you will get emails from partners that want you to get your. 365 management business and sell you services after you use that service. <sighs> yeah, that's true. So we just need to provide one of our uh, partner numbers and be done with it. <laughs> you want to be partner of record, Mike? Yeah. Do they even have PORs anymore? I don't, yeah. even, I don't think they got rid of PORs. Uh, I think they still do. Otherwise, yeah. we'd have a dissolution of the partner ecosystem if you couldn't get credit for the people you've got under management. Yeah, but I thought they changed it to now because I was a POR for a couple of folks, and they I haven't seen any anything come back from Microsoft in probably two years. Mm -hmm. I think they changed it to a minimum a minimum number of return that you have to have in order to be recognized. You know, yeah. it has to be a minimum number of seats. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Or something like that. I don't know what it is. Well, that yeah. kind of defeats. It, it, I, look, I've not followed that. I'm not a you know a, a, a CSP or an MSP, uh, and so I'm not i have not been paying attention to some of that that messaging. But um, but that really then hurts the small guys that are trying the independents yeah. that are trying to build a business to get up to that point. If that's but they the case. changed they changed all that last year. They changed all the the different certifications and everything that you need to become a, a partner. And I'm, we're getting we're digressing a little bit here, but yeah. it's. You know that that whole thing is has changed, making it again what you said, making it harder for um, the smaller uh, yeah. Microsoft resellers. Just well, true. Yeah, but technically, like uh, look, Collab Talk, my company is a we're I'm a registered partner. I don't have any of the certifications. I'm not a you yeah. know gold or silver anything. I'm just I I, I don't spend any time. It's not what I go and do. But I'm just action packed. I mean that's yeah. you know. Yep. So. All right, let's uh, let's jump into the next one. Uh, uh, David asks, um, uh, "Hello, uh, anyone know of any three six five option to do email to do mail merge of many to one without having to install a third party app?" Mm. I've never done a mail merge ever. A mail merge? Well, I think I think we're misunderstanding. It's an um, to move uh, multiple mailboxes into one. Or is it right. an actual mail merge, like a Word, Microsoft Word mail merge? Yeah, you, that's kind of a big difference. Multiple mailboxes, right? Uh, that's my understanding. That's okay. how I read it. Because a, a, a mail merge, that's a that's a term used. I know, in, in Word and, and <laughs> Exchange and to, you know, write yeah. and build a list and send out a mailing list. I don't yeah. think that's yeah. what it is. It's, yeah. I'm not aware of any tool, though. I mean... Internal tool or whatever, it's a third party. I'm sure someone makes something, but yeah, he's saying there's no way his company's going to allow a third party inside. And I, I've been with those organizations too. It's like 
trying to pull teeth. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, other organizations have kind of gone and built their own scripts and, and things around that, but otherwise they turn to third party to do a lot of that. I mean, the exchange space and a lot of you know these kinds of problems, it's it's a pretty mature space. And I just think that Microsoft, the way that they approach some problems, not all, but they'll they look at some of these problems and say, is this going to close net new business or bring in net new business for us? Or is it something that is there, you know, will we get any return on going and spending time developing these features? Yeah. And they say no, and it's a low to a non-priority and they just yeah. leave it to the partners to do it. So, yeah, yeah, not that I'm aware of. Sorry, Dave. Yeah. All right. Uh, fan favorite, uh, uh, Julie here with another Julie question. Hernandez. Julie Hernandez. Um, Best advice to limit access of our IT support team to the HR and finance SharePoint sites while allowing them to be administrators. How do you handle that? Admin roles? Well, I'll, I'm happy to take this one. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, by default, SharePoint is going to um, segregate administration from content owners. When you set up SharePoint, admin roles allow you to administer a farm or a tenant, but they give administrators no access to content by default. A lot of site admins think that they've got access to content. They don't until you set up a web application user policy or explicitly grant um, administrators mm. some role within your site collection. So by default, as long as that segregation is maintained, um, you have what you need. Now, the real problem is that administrators can then go and create these uh, web application user policies uh, or make changes that would grant them uh, access to the content. The only way you can combat that is with audit logs. Um, and basically, you know, you have to trust the admins to do their job. Um, set up some sort of alert or email uh, in the event that permissions change. Um, I know I've done a couple of uh, implementations where IT wanted notifications if uh, permissions changed on any sort of sites. Uh, it, it was primarily Teams based, um, but those um, events exist and you can be alerted. And that would be your um, way to know that something might have changed or that they've got access when they weren't expressly given that sort of access by you or someone else but i mean the roles by the, the roles are there by default and it's only when somebody crosses the line um, that they get access to the content we well, have a lot of small organizations where the person the administrator also has to have access to that and that's the, this i'll use the g word you know that's why you need to review on a regular basis your governance policies especially as your organization um, grows as you expand the IT team. You want to make sure there's the kind of the separation of those uh, that, that ownership. If you eventually have somebody who owns that and is kind of your, you know, uh, uh, your IT person dedicated to your department and take away that responsibility for, at the global level. Um, but that's why you need to uh, refresh, you know, assess and refresh that governance uh, plan on a regular basis to make sure that it's still, you know, are the policies that we have in place are still meeting our needs? Are we, uh, and if you're regularly auditing, if you're making sure things are secure and compliant, um, that'll probably come up in that conversation. It should, anyway, who has access to what data is an important part of that. Yeah, there are plenty there. of permissions reporting tools um, that serve that purpose of letting you know. But one uh, one caveat, Julie, is if they expressly obey that administrative segregation, once you have problems inside the site collection, you're on your own. The admins can't get in to help you unless you grant them some sort of rights. So that's that's the caveat. Yeah, which you can always do to temporarily resolve that you know technical issue and and yep or or deal with Microsoft support. Mike, you were saying something. Oh, I was just going to say, I thought that 365 really kind of enhanced the reporting capabilities with the new security center and all that kind of stuff, but also uh, Azure AD, because Azure AD uh, with uh, uh, the ability, the, uh, what do they call it, the agent, 
uh, for 365 that goes into log analytics in Azure. Um, if you bring that agent in, it reports on everything that's going on in 365 from an audit perspective, logins, you know, the whole bit. So it just becomes a matter of uh, getting real good with filtering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. Needle in the haystack. All right, uh, let's see. I don't see no other questions coming through from the live stream, so we'll just keep going through the list. Um, 13, Jericho. Um, my free Teams account. Oh, hey, there we go, another free Teams account. Um, using my Outlook.com had this feature. Um, so it's the copy meeting link, so inviting people to join a meeting. Um, so where I could just send the link to my guest to my meet uh, like how Zoom does. So I decided to subscribe for a 365 business basic account and use my domain, hoping to have the same feature. Unfortunately, after a few tinkering in the options and permissions, the best I can do uh, only for guests is to invite them using their email just to be able to join. Not quite how Zoom works. Yeah, and that's, that's a limitation of active uh, Azure Active Directory. Yeah. That's all about so the guest permissions. And so. Yeah, so he's asking, is there a way I could do an invite via link for people to join? He wants to use it for his students, and Zoom is quite expensive compared to Teams Business Basic. Maybe you yeah. can, do it. can you do anonymous? No. Oh, okay. You've got to at least be uh, an external. A defined external user. Yeah. So can you make one single user and then uh, share that, I mean, link that user and then give that link to 10 people? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. That. I think GDR, P, GDPR people would be rolling over in their graves right now. But, hey, I'm just asking because I know some yeah. people, somebody's probably attempted it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm well, sure you're correct. I see, I mean, the, the just basically being able to share out a link and control who it is. I mean, my, my first thought is that I, like I'm, I do, I go in and create the Teams meeting. Most of the stuff I'm doing via Outlook, and I forward that via Outlook, and they've got a link. Yeah, but we're, we're, those people are actually named users. Yeah. So you actually have separate named users. It's not like, you know, just sending, he'd have to put all of his students into um, yeah. his AD in order to, to accomplish that. But if it's he just like, wants uh, to uh, send it to, drive. yeah, they'd have to be guest users. Yeah, he just wants to send it to student1 at gmail.com through student10 at gmail.com. He doesn't have them in there. They won't go. They won't allow you to do that. Yeah. Yeah, for a meeting. I mean, that's that's kind of the difference with using a live event. If you're just broadcasting and yep. want to send out an anonymous link, you can get it through the live events. But yeah, this is, a, I know we, we keep saying this, but the difference between Teams and Zoom is that Teams is an enterprise application it's yep. meant for a for different scenarios and so oh, yeah. it's, it's meant to be secure it's it's a it's a strength that you can send it only to named users and and to go through that that pain painful well, process but sean <laughs> making faces there but yeah. it's more how than me <laughs> well what's interesting is i mean if you remember skype skype you used to be able to, to have guest users yeah yeah you know yeah you could bring in as many guest users as you wanted but then when they started converting Skype for business over to Teams, you lost that capability. Gave Skype both barrels. Yeah, I don't know if that's, what's the roadmap around this? Anybody aware? I don't see that need to, uh, you know, the whole service is based around being able to identify uh, who's authenticated to access it. And I, I don't see that changing. I mean, maybe at some point, they will add to the service so that you could invite people anonymously. But I don't even want to think about how teams would have to change to accommodate that. Well, you think about, take, take a step back here, and you think about how Microsoft has architected the the whole presence of a, of a person or a device being connected to a service. Everything, everything is a named object. Mm -hmm. So everything has to be a named object with Microsoft. It can't be just you know, guest. It can't be just someone, you know. Um, so other services aren't like that. They don't have that architecture behind it because they also don't offer as many services and things that can tie in to those objects. You know, Zoom doesn't offer, uh, you know, three or 400 other services. 
in the cloud, you know, like Microsoft does, and they're trying to make it a whole linkable ecosystem, if you will. Um, so I understand that there's there's big differences between the two, and I really feel that, you know, I I personally think that Zoom is more uh, is more flexible um, than Teams is, and it's you know it's got it's got the ability to do things that that uh, I need and other people need, um, and Teams is. Teams is Teams. I mean, it's it's a it's either a device or an or or a person object, and that's it. Yeah, I've watched my wife and her coworkers, and I mean, I brought up Teams initially, and Zoom just works for them. So yeah. yep. I stopped trying to fight that battle. Yep. Yeah, we've talked about that a lot. If you go and and do a search on the uh, the twenty four weekly the the episodes. And you'll have uh, Zoom coming up a lot. Remember, this is a way back machine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. how we, used to, we actually used to do this out on, on Zoom and and, uh, and share that out there. And, and, and we just kept getting grief from yeah. uh, you know, people every How single week. How come you're not week. using Teams, Christian? How come it's, you're not using it's Teams? Microsoft product people that are using Zoom. They're like, yeah. yeah. Explain every week. Like, there's a reason why we're doing it. And Why so, are you using Facebook? Uh, Why aren't you using Yammer? Back off, trolls. Uh. <laughs> I don't think anybody. I've never heard that one, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Said no one ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's funny. Yeah. It's funny because it's true. <laughs> All right. Uh, Chad asked a question. Is there a way as the admin to be able to view a user's chat history without the user knowing? Asking for a friend. No, I asked that. <laughs> I that. Uh, he says security issue. That's why I'm asking. I don't know. I don't know if you can do that or not. I mean, that's like, that's like uh, the old days when you would... Uh, the email admin would uh, give rights, give permissions to open another mailbox. And uh, when I was when I was in when I was an IT administrator for a company a long time ago, and the, C, the CEO comes to me and tells me that he needs permission to open this other person's mailbox, and I'm like, I'm not going to jail over this because <laughs> you're getting in, you're getting into some privacy and you know. Could even be a HIPAA violation. It could be a GDPR. It could be anything. I mean, you got to be incredibly careful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I reminds me of the place I used to work at. The uh, when the good general manager left and the not so good general manager arrived, uh, he installed himself in the root of the Exchange Server Mail Store, so he could look at any and everything <sighs> at any time for any reason. That's... Michael Scott, the office. <laughs> <laughs> Go look uh, at anybody's email. <laughs> my kids just watched that episode. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah no so party they, for you, Michael. Uh, do, 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 just looking to see. Where we're, up to, we're up to Julie again point person to it but well I, just uh, to, to finish this question though um so i mean the the what's the, the if for a chat versus the threaded discussion in the chat it's a secure discussion between the participants and so it you know it's it's stored via exchange folders um and is searchable uh, under those profiles can an admin go in and get access to that and and save that to their it's, it's they have very limited access to any of that that content. I'm actually looking for an article well, on the topic. Send, send somebody a private message because there's chat, which is available to everyone. But then you can also send a private message, right? No, the, the chat. Yeah. The, the chat. There's the chat, which is the one to one. The two of us. We're the only two participants in that. The conversation that's a channel conversation is oh. different. And because that's I, what the I guess team I, has access to. I guess it's a terminology because I'm looking at a Teams window right now and it says meeting chat. You can have a multi-person chat that's different from a channel conversation. Well, if it's a meeting chat, though, everybody in the meeting can see it, right? 
Right, but I could start if I wanted to start a, a chat with Let's Christian like and that. you right, right now and leave Hal out. I could do that, and it doesn't have to be associated with anything. Right. I thought it was yeah. a per, that was a personal. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm yeah. thinking of it so, from another. So no, it, it, so it, to be clear though is that it, you know Teams as and Microsoft 365 is a business application. Therefore, the you know the like you are not a in as an individual in that environment that tenant. Unless you're the owner of the tenant, Collab yeah. Talk is my tenant. Like you don't own the content what's in this that system. That yeah. chat conversation is part of that record. So while they're not able just to go in and look at, hey, I'm going to read through Sean's chats with Mike today and do the Michael Scott follow along. Uh, <laughs> you can go into the compliance center um, to keep, you know, and do the what is it the content search and filter and go and search mm -hmm. on. This. You and so you, you need to be able to do that if if the company is sued yep. and I need to go in and see if, you know, wow. Hal has been talking about um, the the his alien abduction, which is classified <laughs> information, then, um, you know, I, I, I need to be able to go in there and search about that. I'm not, I'm not you out him. anything. Stupid. Is there, you you keep on bringing up the probing, Christian. You got to get away from that. <laughs> there was no probing involved, you know, as far as we know. And that's what Hal tells us. So you know, it, was just a, it was just a straight up abduction. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to say yeah. So to answer that that question, um, it, it's not just to go into the chat history. So it's a bit more uh, granular. They would have to go and search the compliance center and do that content search to be able to find something. So it, it's uh, it, 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 I, I don't think that they could just go in there through those controls. I've not gone in and attempted this, but just read through what are the last 10 chat histories that Sean had. Um, you can't view the content that way. It's 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 broken up. You'd have to go in and look at it. Like what intellectual property has uh, Sean um, erroneously shared with somebody via chat, so that well, I could fire him. And this this opens up something else too. Is that it concerns me that a person who's concerned about this from a, and I, I I don't mean to give you any guff about this. Um, who's the person who posted this? Chad. Chad, I don't mean to give you any guff about this, really, uh, but I do because if you're if you're doing this from a security aspect, you shouldn't even be asking this question on a public forum. Number one, um, and number two, I mean this is a, a this dives into all kinds of legal here, and uh, hopefully your company has some kind of policies around this. Uh, maybe it's just a you know a smaller shop. I don't know, but. Um, there should be a little bit more background on this. <laughs> Seek legal counsel, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just to know what you can and can't do. Well, and I mean. Or what you once, should and shouldn't do. Once, once he looks at that, he's liable. You have to understand. I mean, once you look at that, you are now part of it. You are now liable. So if anything goes with that, you're going right along with it. <laughs> Sean, are you checking out the live stream? Would you stop? <laughs> uh, all right. Okay. You want me to be quiet? Just say. Uh, Shut up. Uh, uh, no, no, no. I was just. Uh, that was good content, he, but I was he's, just. He's mucking around. It just right. happened to capture an interesting uh, thing with me cleaning my glasses. No, I'm just. Uh, I'm excited that our next question is from Julie. <laughs> Julie, Julie. Julie. Yes. We gotta have Julie on back. the show. Look we got to get Julie on the show. This is a shout out, Julie. We want you to join us on the show. You've had the most questions. We really enjoyed answering these questions for you. It's the ones that we could answer, and you know, Sean would really like to to talk to you about your <laughs> SharePoint stuff. Um, Christian would like you to take it, go to Branson and hang out. So, join us, Julie. Well, we have. <laughs> We, we, so over the course of the day, these two, part one and part two, four different Julie questions. I just mm -hmm. think that, you know, she, I, we definitely want to have Julie join us on camera, but she needs to, I don't know, step it up, bring five questions or something. I don't know. It needs to dazzle us. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty dazzled. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, Julie asks uh, question 15. Um, Using Office 365, I'm not an IT expert. I shared 
SharePoint site access to an external user or client who is using the G Suite. Uh, that user's company then switched to Office 365 and changed email addresses. I granted access to the new email and the link will not work. She keeps getting the prompt to request access. I granted access and it still won't let her view the files. Yes. Any thoughts yes. on what I need to do on our end? That URI has, has the actual identifier in it, right, Sean? I'm pretty sure the URI will have the identifier I, of the I at least the tie the, ends, yeah. at least the email domain. It may not have the complete email address, but it at least has the URI of the, uh, embedded in it. All those funky numbers and letters and everything afterwards. It's just an encrypted, you know, uh, hash of text. And usually, when it, you this happens in OneDrive. So if you actually share out a file in OneDrive, it does that one drv.ms. Um, but if you share it out to a specific user, it adds a bunch of, of characters to the end, and that's actually identifying, you know, the domain that's, that this person is supposed to click, you know, that clicks in is supposed to have. So I, I, I'm, I'm betting that that's what's going on. Yeah, I believe you're right, and it, so it's 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 treating it like it, it, it's not the same person to the system. So right. you have to use a create a brand new link and reshare that. Yeah. Out. And our resident SharePoint expert is looking like, yeah, you guys are full of crap. Um, no, I, I, I just, <laughs> I'm familiar with the situation, but um, not so much the specifics on what gets uh, crafted. So what you're saying makes sense to me. Um, I just haven't had the experience to personally verify it. That's all I'm saying. That's why I'm looking sort so, of uh, flexible. Yeah. And I take this from I take this from a, I work a lot with uh, Citrix Sharefile and Citrix, Citrix Sharefile is is incredibly secure compared to OneDrive or Box or Dropbox or whatever. Um, and they actually embed the entire. If you said that this person gets access, that entire email identifier is in that URI, and nobody else can connect to that unless they're connecting as that person. <laughs> so. Yeah, I've I've run into this problem. I, it, it's been a it's been a difficulty where because I have the the problem with like my MVP profile, so the email that I use for that is different than I use for yeah. every other system. And yeah. so as we all do, I I have to remember between various Microsoft properties, I have three different emails: two yeah. historical and my one current. And so I have to remember which one did I log in for that. And so people will often send me uh, a link to something to the wrong Christian Buckley, some archive, there's no actual profile behind it anymore. Only my email you know, access gets me into that. Um, and, and so they have to resend the link to the correct email. And you, only it's sent out three? you only have three? You only have three? I've got like <laughs> 10. <laughs> In the Microsoft systems? Oh. No, because I, I, I kind of understood that early on and I switched over to, uh, to my Hotmail and stopped using company emails. For well, things. that whole Microsoft ID transition, I don't know if you guys remember that, when we started getting emails saying, hey, if you're on Microsoft ID, you won't be able to use this service because it requires a work or school account. Yeah. And I even log into services today where I'll come back and say, this is a work or school account. You have to just use a Microsoft ID. Some of the Visual yeah. Studio stuff is yeah. that way. I've Because my Bitstream Foundry account, there's the personal one, there's the work one. <laughs> and you have to know which one to present to the service. Yeah. Yep. And at one point, at some point, they said they were going to try and they, tie it all. Consolidate, yep. yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that just never <laughs> happened. <laughs> I think, nope. Yeah, they gave up. <laughs> yeah. I can well, understand what, why. What I heard, and this may be rumor, but what I heard was, the actual back end to the Microsoft ID system um, that was causing all the problems is it was actually an Oracle back end. <laughs> oh Imagine that. <laughs> well, Julie, though, the, the, so the answer to that, pro <laughs> the problem is, yes, you need to make sure that, 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 you know, that it's they're logged in using the new email, but the, that link that you're trying to use is from, is an invitation to the old email. You have to generate an entirely new link to the new email, and then they have them logged in that way, and they should be able to get in. Another question I'd add, like to ask Julie is if they, to find out why. And well, she's not going to find out. But why would why would you, if you were going to move from G Suite to 365, would you change email addresses? 
I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense because it's the email address has nothing to do with the provider. I mean, it's just a DNS change. That's all it is. So I don't know. <laughs> Good point. Well, I don't know. No idea. Well, when we have her on the show, we'll quiz her. That's right. Yeah. We'll have to go back this historically and. Uh, and now we're guaranteed she won't show up. <laughs> it'll just be the Julie hour, the two hour, two segments and, uh, and well, Julie again and don't go through. Hey, don't give up on Mickey. I'm not. We're 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 getting we're getting to uh, to Mickey. We got another 15 minutes. Um, nice time. Here, here's one. Raul asks in 16. Uh, someone know why only some users do not uh, allow them to change the wallpaper? Uh, it doesn't even allow them to see the option. So in Teams, being able to go in there and uh, and configure and change the background, the wallpaper. That is an admin scene. setting. That is an admin setting. Is that per user? Or I thought that was everybody has the ability. It is everybody either on or off. <laughs> so I know that's an admin that's an admin setting because I turned it on and off to see if yeah yeah and that's per user after that. So your assumption is that this question, I think that makes sense. Raul's maybe not talking about I mean, his own organization. He's just talking about people that he knows and some aren't, don't see it and some do. Yeah. I makes mean, sense. Thanks, Christian. I appreciate that. Thank you. Nailed it. Nailed it. All right. Um, Pernilla, number 17, asks, uh, when trying to log in using the computer app, I get the message that I'm not authorized to my own organization in the free version. I tried to reinstall the app, but it doesn't help. Is this a known issue? Is there a known solution? The what app? Which app, Christian? Was it? Yeah. Using the computer app. Which, which computer app? <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. There was no, I, I had one of these situations <laughs> earlier today when my wife kept talking about the plug. The plug. I'm like... Computer. Can we Computer. <laughs> put it down, Scotty? <laughs> How quaint. Uh, I, uh, yeah. yeah I, was this um, nabbed out of any specific forum or list or like it might be a Teams thing? Um, it was it was either the, the Teams or the Office 365 page. So the uh, in, in the book of faces. Yeah, if you per, Pernilla do a quick search on Pernilla. Hang on. I'll see if I can find some. I don't I mean look at apps. I'm I'm I type in find an app and I put computer. <laughs> I <can't>, don't. <laughs> look at that. Look at that. The Comtella Contact Center. That's what comes up. I don't know. That's I, what comes up. I assume she means the uh, I, Teams. In Teams. In okay. Teams. So she's using the installed app. I assume that's what she means by using computer. the free the, the free version. Yeah. Not authorized to my own organization. Yeah. Well, does she have a? Is her own organization? So somebody asked, uh, so Hassam uh, said, hey, contact the admin. Uh, is maybe there's no service license assigned to you. License, given yeah. That it's a, given that it's a free version, um, and her response is, I'm the administrator since I'm the only one in my company, and I'm using the free version, uh, but use my email to be a guest at another company's teams, and they use the paid version. So, Well, uh, that makes sense. I mean... It, you can have your own. The free version will allow you to obviously connect to um, meetings and whatnot, but you can't start a meeting unless you got a license assigned. You can't set those resources up in your tenant unless you've got a license assigned. Yeah, I think that the, again, that my understanding, I've not played with the free version, but the free version, it doesn't provide you. But with you're going to do that, right? You're going to report back? Uh, going eventually if i do the work i will homework. homework 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 so but so my so uh, my understanding of the free version of this of teams was that it allowed an individual end user to go in and participate 
in Teams activities, it doesn't then give them an entire Teams environment. Is that incorrect? That's incorrect. Okay. See, that's uh, I've not gone in and played it with this. Them, it gives them an entire team environment. It's just limited. So there are specific things. If you look at that chart that I linked to, there are specific things that aren't available from an admin perspective. Okay. Um, but the other things are, you know, reduced. So, you know, the numbers are reduced of how many users you can have and so on and so forth. No yes. So that's so news to me. So. Conferencing. Yeah, so on the admin, if you take a look at the admin portion of it, though, Sean, towards the bottom, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's saying admin tools for managing users and apps. You don't get that with the right. free version, you know, so you can't really say, hey, contact your admin and they'll sort this out for you because with the free version, there is no admin tool. Right. It's just a client app. That's just a client app that you can start a meeting from. Yeah, so. That, that's the, I guess that's the question we need to know from Pernilla's, um, you know, what, what are you getting the not authorized to access to for the organization? Right. Is there, if are you not even, even able to get into the free app that you're the end user app or, yep. you know, like, so, yeah. Need more input. Need more info. All right. Common problem we have. Uh, do you still have that link? Uh, you know, here I don't have the link that you had shared. Let me, if you, Mike, if, you if you could share that again. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's only right up the chat. It's right there. It says, you see it? Uh, I just right here. Post it again. Yeah, okay. Sean just copied it. Thank you. Sweetly. I'm just going to move that. I'm going to also paste that over into the uh, Facebook. You said you did that already. I did in this morning's Facebook live stream. Oh, I thought you just did it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No. Yeah. I, I'm no. where you are, Mike. I, I, it's here in the chat here in Teams, but I also am pasting it over in the Facebook live stream. That's what I thought you did earlier, but that, that's okay. I'm confused. Yeah, that was a different live stream. That was this morning's live stream. Roger, Roger. It's a different page. Oh, Roger, Roger. Okay. Yeah. Of clearance, Clarence. What's your vector? What's your vector, Victor? <laughs> I am serious and don't call me Shirley. Yes. Uh, all right, 18. Justin says, I have two users who are randomly getting a message in Teams that their microphone is not detected. Hmm. One user is on a brand new Lenovo T15. Is that, isn't that the Terminator? Um, with the clean Lenovo. They start at T800. T oh, sorry. The with the clean image on it. And all that were easily found. Uh, one's on a brand new Lenovo with a clean image and all drivers are up to date and I cannot seem to find any reason why this randomly happens. Well, I will start by saying don't use the microphone on your laptop, but yeah, and I randomly have it happen just like my teams was messed up. I met, I did a, a complete uninstall and reinstall of teams and uh, magically my microphone works now. So yeah. I'm some of the standard microphone stuff probably applies like if you allow the uh, microphone to be turned off for power throttling and savings um, normally what they'll tell you is any of those devices that need to stay awake all the time you don't allow them to be um, on your power profile suspended temporarily to conserve power and things not only that but it's also um, some apps will take exclusive control of a right. device uh, as we have seen webcams microphones stuff like that well it's something too to be aware of it, it i don't know if this is a it's just another additional information needed is it happening in the middle of a meeting or are you talking about in between sessions the yeah. in between sessions i think for what you just explained as well as the fact that teams uh, and I, I always joke that the the era of plug and play is is uh is dead you know, uh, Teams is very sensitive to settings in other applications. You shut down Teams, you have a different setting set up on another application. It can come back and where your system is just still somehow pointing to a different configuration and uh, Teams gets confused by that. And so it's one of those things where, uh, you know, at the beginning of any meeting, I do that quick check. Is it still pulling in from my USB microphone, is it to my THX speakers, or occasionally, because both of my 
fancy monitors have speakers and microphones built in. Never use them because it's horrible sound and, and audio in and out. Yeah. Uh, but uh, occasionally it will find one of them and use it. Uh, and so I try to nip that in the bud. Yeah. So, you know, it, at least make sure the machine's running. You're not coming out of sleep or suspend. Um, test the microphone ahead of time. And if it's happily, happening during the meeting, I don't think we've got a good suggestion for that right now other than teams. And if nothing else works, you can always, uh, you know, use a, a plug and exercise the headphone jack. That's another interesting era where things can go. Yeah. It's simple. It's silly. Yep. Sounds better. Get yourself a blue snowball or a, yes. a Yeti. Blue, blue Yeti. Yes. I've got the Yeti. Uh, yeah. They're back ordered. If you go to Staples, you can get one. I wanted a Yeti Pro, and they are back ordered. Can't oh. get them anywhere. Yeah. It's like the COVID hit, everybody worked from home, and then all the, you couldn't get, you can't get webcams, you can't get microphones, you can't get, you can't even get green screens, you know. I, I've got a stash, Mike. Make me an yeah. offer. Yeah. Some, <laughs> some of that stuff, I would say that uh, go out and do the using buy now on eBay. You can find a lot of that stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, jacked up prices. You know. uh, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Um, number 19. We're almost at the end. We're almost to Mickey. He's next. Um, Nils Eric uh, says, I bought a Microsoft 365 family subscription today. Is there a convenient way to create a shared folder with all family members so that everyone can sync it via OneDrive on their PCs? Or do I have to manually add everyone via their email address? I don't know how big you, his family is, but that shouldn't be a big deal to add your family members one by one. Oh. Yeah, and there is no way in uh, yeah. 365 family to do that. In OneDrive, you have to add each individual email address because you don't have SharePoint. So... You have SharePoint. I, I shouldn't say that. You have SharePoint. It's the back end for OneDrive, or OneDrive is the back end for SharePoint. So you have it, but you don't you don't have the capability just to add users to it. All right. And finally, let's wrap up on Mr. Mickey Rourke, famed you actor, do. icon, uh, former professional semi. Was he professional boxer or semi pro? Was semi -pro. he amateur? He was, he was semi, semi pro. Yeah. Okay. He made like, and overall, he made something like sixty some movies in his lifetime. Yeah, yeah. It was just, it's a crazy number. It's like he, he was, you know, even if he was in a movie for a minute, but he made just the list goes on and on and on. Well, it doesn't go on and on. It ends at sixty. <laughs> so technically, that was it. You know, false information. I almost spit out my water. That would have been bad. <laughs> kind of like I did. Uh, that's that's the kind of I do these logic things jokes with my my middle son my son Nick where I'll say, say something he's like well that's really hot they're like well you know what's hotter than that he's like no what I said anything with the temperature that's higher than the thing of what you're talking about I'm surprised you don't know that yeah. and that's that's like our running joke yeah anyway sorry Mick, Mickey says my colleague created a wrong email for a user see that's the problem right there don't create the wrong emails. <laughs> Come on. Uh, yeah. Like, so you, have you have yeah. one job. You have one job. My colleague <laughs> created a wrong email for a user, which she has been using for a while. That That's using a fake email. That's like um, <laughs> it's against the law. We're not going to make it through this uh, all right. question with uh, the running but, commentary. So for uh, only this week, we corrected the email. When composing an email to her, the directory shows the correct email. How can I avoid the directory to not display the old email and only show the corrected email? Is it possible? Uh, when I go search for her when composing an email to her name, the wrong email still comes up. Well, if it's in the history, yeah, it's going to have to do the cache. Yeah. It's cache yeah. history. Yeah. Um, uh, which can confuse people. Uh, this is the case of an alias, the wrong email. It also happens to be this, the, the username we use to log in to Outlook on the web. I know about the cross out button. So to be able to delete the cache in Outlook on the web okay. when composing email to her, but at times it comes back. Uh, the question is, how do you remove the wrong email? So it's, it's very simple. I mean, basically you're going to create an alias with the right email or the one already there. 
you delete the you make that one the primary and then you delete the the uh, the bad one. It sounds like a technical shell game. Yeah, all you're doing all you're doing is is taking an alias and making it primary. You can make any alias that you have a primary sure. uh, on your account. So that's all you're doing is you're just changing the primary and it automatically becomes the default email address for you in the address book. Right. Well, it, and, unless and, uh, I should I should preface that though, unless the address book is on premises and the address book on premises doesn't allow for updates. So you have two separate address books. You can have two separate address books. You can have a, a gal up in the in exchange uh, online and you can have a gal on premises, which can have two different sets of information if you don't allow them to cross update. Right. Well, and, and he continues, he says, the question is how do you remove that wrong email? I think we just kind of explained that. Even her, in her profile, do I have to run a PowerShell command on the ADS and sync it? it? Kind of gets annoying seeing the wrong email. Still, I mean, one, you can't go in and replace the history if you if no. those are important history that need to remain. You can't purge that and, sw and swap it out. Right. You can clear it from the cache. You can fix it going forward. Make that the primary. Correct. And what I would do is I'd, I'd, I'd before you do any of that, create a PSD. You know, create a backup of the entire mailbox. I know, pal. I know how, but you create a backup of the mailbox, not necessarily PSD, but at least back it up. No, 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 no. I got nothing against doing that. People should think about that more often. Yeah. I just, I just like Hal's correction. It's just cheap insurance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh. That's great. Hey, well, gentlemen, we're we're over on the time. So uh, appreciate everybody for joining in today. And for those that uh, watched, and the recording, of course, will be out on uh, the Collab Talk YouTube page, and you'll be able to find the link list of every topic that we've covered over the morning and evening sessions. Will be out on BuckleyPlanet.com in the office hours, and we'll be back next Monday at the same bat time, bat channel. And that's a time you can take seriously. Yes, 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Pacific every Julie Monday. Julie Hernandez, send a an email to uh, office hours at collabtalk.com and uh, let us know if we can count on you next session. Well, I'll, I'm gonna I'll reach out to her on Facebook and invite her. But uh, yeah, so you can also email us at office hours at collabtalk.com as Sean just said, and send us questions during the week and we'll uh, we'll respond to them. So there's a handful of us that uh, are awake during the week and <laughs> not, so I'm not I have, on that list. I, I have homework to write a script for next week. Chris, Christian, what's your homework again? What? I was, <laughs> Sean, I'm auditing this class. <laughs> oh, auditing yeah. this class. That's, yeah. uh, that's a very interesting way to put it. Yeah, I, I do want to go in and do that. Look, for personal reasons, we keep seeing these questions pop up around the for free medicinal circuit. purposes. I understand. Yeah, I would like to. That's right. <laughs> I'd like the. It's like a. It's a, an herbal remedy. I'd like to go and understand those medicinal benefits. You Strictly know. for medicinal purposes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, take it right. orally or rectally. It doesn't matter. So. Right. <laughs> oh. On that note. On that note. Oh, it all comes back to the probes. <laughs> what is it with you, man? <laughs> all right, gentlemen. Bye. Enjoy the rest of your uh, probe free evenings, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Catch you on the flip side. Right. I'm out. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>